Hey there, and welcome to day five of the Artwork Living Five Day Painting Challenge. I am so glad to have you all here. And on top of it, we are now at the end, not really the end, just the beginning, I hope, of your consistent painting practice. So glitter showers, toast of champagne, all of those things, because you've made it to day five. Today we're gonna to be talking in particular about how you assess, tweak, and then amplify what we've covered during the five day challenge. So we're gonna talk about how you go back and assess and adjust what your new painting practice is. So let's review really quickly the things that we've covered over the last five days. First of all, I've talked a lot, I mean a lot, about the three-legged stool that forms the solid base for your painting practice to create a sustainable practice that allows you to become a thriving artist instead of a starving artist. Remember, the first part of that is what we've worked on the last five days. It's getting that solid painting practice underway so that you can paint in flow. It's having a firm structure to your painting practice so then you can be creative within that structure. Remember, it takes a box to be able to be free. So the first part, the foundation that underlies everything is making awesome paintings. And the best way to make awesome paintings that you'll love is to show up and do something towards your painting practice every day. The second leg of the stool, and equally important, is the work component. And remember that work is not just the business. Business supports the work. The work is the impact you're gonna have in the world. It's the success path that you define for yourself, whether that is selling your work online yourself, getting into a gallery, teaching how you make art in a workshop or online, or how you want to support causes that you believe in really strongly. In either case, any of those cases, you need to build an engaged audience of followers and fans who adore what you do. So business strategies are the things that help you get there. We're going to talk about more, uh, more about both of those things in just a few minutes. The third part of that is creative living. Remember, I prescribed fun. You've got to have fun. You've got to include play. You've got to include something outside of just your painting. You can't become a thriving artist if all you do is paint 24-7. Are you hearing me? You absolutely have to do the full nine yards. You've got to have not just the painting foundation, you've also got to know what you think of as success and have a strategy to get there. And you have to, absolutely have to, include some play in your life. Make time for family and friends. Cross train in a discipline that's not related to art at all that feeds your soul and feeds your creative practice. Those three things form a firm foundation for a thriving, sustainable, successful painting practice. Then we talked about the steps that form the habit loop so that you can get in the habit of making those paintings, of showing up every day and getting to work. The first part of the habit loop is creating cues that tell your mind, remember we're trying to control monkey mind, that's the chatterbox part of it, the left brain, that's very linear in its thought processes. I'm not talking about woo here. Um, I'm talking about the actual physical biological structure of your brain. The way the left side of the brain works is very analytical, very linear. And we need to work on shutting that down so that your bright, right brain can take over when you paint. And you can paint more confidently and in flood. So triggers and cues are the first step to do that. Remember, they need to appeal to the five senses, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. Then when you stack those together, particularly if you're able to stack something from each one of those categories, then you're gonna create a routine that reinforces the habit. 
when you repeat that routine often enough, it creates the habit. And then remember yesterday we talked about rewards, that rewards are the cement, the glue that holds the habit together. That as human beings, we respond better to positive reinforcement than negative reinforcement. And you can do this for yourself through giving yourself a reward at the end of something that's been challenging, been difficult, and you've achieved something. So it's very important to, to remember to reward yourself and also to look at failures as simply an opportunity to grow. Remember, I said you need to fail forward fast. You learn so much from things that we ordinarily consider failures. So make sure that you include rewards and that you allow yourself to occasionally not be perfect. So super important to do that. Then today we are talking about that reflection and adjustment. Reflection is really key. The people who don't really achieve their goals, the people who seem to always be striving, are the ones who never stop long enough to look at where they came from and where they are right now so they can adjust to get where they want to be. So when you finish a project, whether it's a five day painting challenge or a social media challenge or a video challenge or a body of work or any other activity, you need to pause. You need to hit the pause button hard and you need to reflect. And that reflection really is more helpful when it goes into words on paper, not typing into a file on a computer, but words made with your hands and a pen on a piece of paper. There's a direct connection between our brains and what our hands do. So if you write your reflection out by hand on a piece of paper, it's going to be processed by your brain in a different way than if you type it in. So reflect, write down what worked really well. Write down as well, what didn't work quite as well for you. And then write down ways you can improve that. So does this sound kind of like the critique sandwich that we talked about yesterday? Because it is. Critique, is just another word for reflection and then adjustment. So at the end of a project, you need to critique yourself, not the negative Nelly voice, because that's not helpful. It does not move people forward. What does move people forward is spending time looking at work, what worked really well. Make a chart, make a list. You don't have to write in full sentences. It can be just bullet points but write down what worked really well. So for example, in the case of the five day painting challenge, you could go back and look at the cues that you used. Which ones really helped you get into the flow of painting? Which ones really didn't have any impact at all? Look at the ones that had the most impact. Look at what part of the habit, the routine that you're forming is working. Then look at where you might need to adjust. Look at what's not working quite as well. So for example, did putting an apron on just not do anything for you? Well, maybe you don't like wearing an apron. So maybe you take that off of the list of cues and you fold something else in. Maybe you're more comfortable painting in yoga pants and a paint shirt. Go for it. Adjust what didn't work and come up with an alternative solution so that you can test that going forward. And remember, everything that you work on is always just a test. That's how you get rid of the fear of failure, is you remember that it's always just a test. Don't hang your hat on perfection. Remember that you can test things, then go back through that reflection process again, adjust according to what worked or didn't work, and test again. I want you to think about how this whole process that we've gone over this week really impacts other areas and not just painting. How could you apply this to the other legs of the stool? And how is it impacted by those other legs of the stool? 
Well, one of those is the creative life. So I want you to think about how you could form the habit of feeding your imagination and think of all the things that go into feeding your imagination. One is that play that I talked about earlier. So think about what it is that you love doing. It's a passion that may not have anything to do with art that you may have felt a little guilty about doing before that you now want to fold into your regular weekly activities because it's a release. It allows you to play, to let your subconscious flow free. I guarantee you it's going to impact your painting in the end. So think about how you can feed your imagination. It could be going to museums or galleries. It could be going to the movies on a, a hot summer afternoon. It could be any of those things. It could be incorporating more dinners with family, coffee dates with friends, but make a conscious effort to fold those things into your weekly routines and form a new habit around feeding your imagination. That third area uh, that I kind of jumped over there is work. Now the work comes, revolves around defining your success path. Now that success path is your ultimate goal. It's where you're journeying to. It's what you want to get to, how you define success as an artist, as a painter. And remember, there are all kinds of ways to do that. As I mentioned earlier, you could sell your art online directly to your customers, directly to your clients and collectors. You can get into a gallery. You can write successful grant proposals to foundations, state and local age arts agencies. You could partner with nonprofits around an issue or a cause that's dear to your heart. It might not involve making money from it at all, but you need to decide how you define success for yourself. And then you want to create the strategies and habits that are gonna get you there. Remember, things have changed dramatically. Gone are the days when we had gatekeepers that we had to pass and gain entry from in order to get to success. Back when I started as a professional artist, back in when I finished graduate school, I got out with my shiny new MFA. And I thought, here I am, where is my gallery? I got an MFA, is this gonna get me into a gallery? Shock and awe, no it doesn't. Galleries are not waiting as you cross the stage with your BFA or your MFA to hand you the key into an artist's success path. You have to forge that path yourself. Now, when I finished school, the only real avenues for an artist were either to get into a gallery or to teach and to teach at a college level with an MFA. So that's what I did for almost 30 years. But along the way, I figured out some other success paths, some other ways to reach my audience that were way more effective than what had been there in the past. So I wanna to talk to y'all about those just a little bit, but I'm gonna stop and check here for just a second and make sure that we've got everything going here into the Facebook group, onto the Facebook page. Make sure that we are live and broadcasting. Yay, it is live, excellent. So I wanna check to see if we have any questions so far. And, hey Ginger, it's good to see you, and Teresa and Ann Davis. And Cheryl, it's wonderful to see y'all. So I'm going to see if I can get this to pull up where I can actually see the questions. Excellent. That does it. So yeah, it's exactly, Cindy. It is only a test. You have to remember that. Um, everything is just a test. Yeah. 
<laughs> Jean Marie says monkey brain is shouting clean the house first. Well, you need to shut that monkey brain off for just a little while. We definitely need to clean the house, but you need to do something else first. So think about prioritizing what you're doing there. Excellent. Okay, let's dive back in here and talk about those processes for just a minute. So when we're looking at creating, an well, first identifying our success path, you need to know what all of those opportunities are you can absolutely be a thriving artist and your choices are not just teaching or a gallery anymore. Things have changed profoundly because of, in a lot of ways, ironically, the great recession, we have many, many, many more choices. Although we had some of those before then as well. Back in 2008, 2009, I became a little alarmed at what was happening in the gallery system. By that time, I was teaching full time, but I also had a successful career, um, side gig, in other words, uh, showing with a gallery, with several galleries. And so I was making money from my paintings on a regular basis. But along came the Great Recession. And one of the side effects of the Great Recession, not a side effect, but one of the effects of the Great Recession was that the art market collapsed in the, the traditional gallery scene. By 2010, those of us who were associated with galleries saw a third of those galleries close in the US. And for most of 2010, very few of us even made a sale. Because we were relying almost solely on what was happening in physical galleries, it meant we were really vulnerable as artists. At the end of that period, I swear I was never going to be that dependent on one or two sources of income ever again because it's not stable. Go back to that three legged stool analogy I used earlier. I think it's very important for artists, anybody else actually as well, to have at least three channels of income, three sources of income identified so that you are completely stable. If one of those dries up, you're not going to go belly up. So I had academia, which was on rocky ground as well at that time. Art departments started closing too. And I had a gallery. Well, my gallery stayed afloat, my main one, but he had a rocky time as well. So I was feeling very nervous. I looked around online and notice that there were artists who are making a living through selling their work online without necessarily being associated with a gallery. And I thought, huh, this looks really interesting. I also was running into the problem of not having enough time to paint in my usual routine and habit. So I addressed both problems at the same time by starting a daily painting project. And through that project of making and posting a painting every day online, I began building my email list. It didn't happen fast. It took a little while. At the beginning, I had, I think, 34 or 37 people on my email list, and two or three of them were me because I had multiple email addresses to make sure that the emails actually were going out correctly. Some were family, actually a lot were family, and then friends. But slowly, but surely, by showing up and taking baby steps every day, my email list grew to the point that I have over 20,000 people on my email list today. So it doesn't necessarily happen fast, but it, if you take small steps, every day towards your goals, you can get there. I began, as I said, posting those paintings. Lo and behold, people noticed on Facebook and would message me and ask if they, if they were for sale. So I began to sell my work online through the posts that I made on Facebook, later on Instagram, and directly through my website. In addition, to selling through a gallery. 
it has ended up that that process reinforces what I do with the gallery. So it's not an either or question. You can do both, but you need to create those alternative income sources in addition to what you might be thinking of traditionally as your income streams. You can create a successful online business. It doesn't have to be out of your reach. Now, some of the things that I've heard from students as being issues that hold them back are the ideas that the gallery is the only way to sell. I think I've knocked that one out because I sell just as much online myself as I do through galleries. It's hard to get into galleries. Well, it is if you don't ever apply. Then another one is not understanding the business related stuff like pricing and marketing. Those are simply business strategies that anybody can learn. Yeah, if you have to figure it out by yourself, it can take you a while. But the reality is that if you go out and look for the people that have those sources, you can learn those really quickly. Those are all acquired skills and it doesn't have to be difficult. I made a big change in my own work online when I realized that marketing was just as creative as painting and that marketing didn't have to be, hey, buy my painting, buy my painting, buy my painting. Instead, that marketing was building relationships. It's all about relationships. Once you realize that, it doesn't feel gross anymore. So there are strategies and paths that you can go down to sell your work online that don't have to feel sleazy. In fact, you don't even have to say, buy my work. In fact, you're probably better off if you don't do that. Another problem that I hear from students is that the tech is overwhelming, that they don't know how to code a website, that they're not sure how to set up their shopping cart, that launching and promoting their work is intimidating. Well, it was for me too when I was trying to figure out how to make it work. There were no courses back then on how to promote your artwork online, at least none that I could find. So I had to figure out a lot of that on my own. But that's changed completely. There are now resources out there that can help you find your way online. And you don't have to have fancy tech tools in order to do that. There are ways to launch and promote your work, whether you have a website or not. Do I recommend a website? Absolutely. 999% I recommend having a website and blogging regularly. But you can get started with tools that you probably already have, like an Instagram account, like a Facebook account, maybe a PayPal account and an email. It doesn't have to be fancy to get started. It just has to be. Does that sound like what I said during the painting challenge as well? Because it's the same thing. Starting the business habit is just like starting the painting habit. And when you tie the two together, it can be really fertile for growing your thriving painting practice. One of the last things that I hear from students is that they just don't have time to paint. Well, I've just proven to y'all you have plenty of time to paint, more than you realize, and to do small amounts each day really does move you down the line. Also, I hear that students say they don't think their work is good enough, so they need to wait for it to become good enough in order to either get a gallery or start selling their work online. Well, when is good enough going to happen? Anybody have an idea? What is good enough? Good enough is when somebody sees your painting and wants it. Good enough is when you do the best you possibly can to make awesome paintings and you're passionate about what you're doing, you love what you're doing, and you share it with the world. Don't wait around to be perfect. Just get started. Start before you're ready. 
one of the biggest issues I see is people waiting around until they've got 30 paintings that are practically perfect in every way. Do you need a body of work? Yeah, you do need a small, consistent body of work, but that body of work could be four or five paintings. It doesn't have to be 30 paintings on 30 by 40 inch panels that are framed and ready to go before you're really ready to put your work out into the world. Get started now. Don't wait to be perfect and start before you're ready. So what's the real story? Talked about the stories that people tell themselves, but what's the real story? The first piece of good news is that the global art market is a 63 billion with a B, that is billion, growth industry worldwide. So there is more than enough room for everyone. So if you've been looking online at other artists that sell their work on their website and thinking, I'm not good enough, or there's so many artists out there doing it, there's just not enough room for me, think again. All of us that are, are together in the painting challenge have work that has an audience for it out there somewhere. There is room enough for all of us to share our work with the world. We are not in competition with each other. The only person we're in competition with is ourselves. So let go of the lack mentality and realize there's enough for all of us. That's the first truth. Second is that the gatekeepers are no longer there. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't work with a gallery. It doesn't mean that I think galleries are the bad guys. Far from it. I love galleries, especially galleries that do their jobs and are partners with artists. But as a gatekeeper, they no longer perform that function. We can reach our audiences directly. So the main strategy to sell your work online is to create awesome work, put it out into the world through social media and through your website, engage with the people who make comments, who like it, encourage them to share it, and convert them from followers into fans to realize that galleries can be a partner and part of that three-legged stool, but they do not have to be the only ones. Do some galleries prefer that you not sell online? I'm sure they do. The ones that I work with are not worried about that because they've realized that the marketing and promotion that I do of my work online benefits them too. So if you're already working with a gallery or you want to work with a gallery, don't think that means that you can't sell your work yourself. But you can't do it through hope marketing. You can't do it by just popping an artwork onto a website and then sitting back and waiting and waiting for your audience to show up because that's not going to happen. You have to reach out and invite your audience in. They're not just going to stroll by your website and find it. So you've got to engage with your fans to convert them into followers. So the internet allows artists to build direct relationships with their audiences, to engage with them, and making gallery representation just one of the options that are out there. The third thing is, that tech does not have to stand in your way. Let me repeat that for all of you out there who are technophobes. Technology does not have to stand in your way. You can do a tremendous amount simply with your cell phone and a social media account. Your cell phone can take fabulous photographs. When you connect those fabulous photographs to your social media accounts, and you use story to engage with your audience, you can move them from being followers and fans to being customers and clients. There are proven, easy strategies for doing that. 
and it doesn't have to take a year for it to happen. Now, it took me a long time, probably about three years to really go because I spent an awful lot of time in there with that hope marketing phase where I was just putting an image on my website and going, well, where are my followers? Where are my fans? Where's my audience? And they didn't just stroll by. I figured out how to get them from my social media accounts to my website to make purchases. So it took me a while to figure that out. It doesn't have to take you that long. That's one of the reasons I'm here. I am on a mission to eliminate the starving artist myth. And one of the ways we do that is by giving students the tools they need to become thriving artists. So I know that you can reach thousands, thousands, I do mean that with a T, thousands of people who can become potential collectors and clients, whatever your success path is defined as, whether you want to sell paintings or whether you want to sell the skills that you have as an artist. I know because that's what happened to me just over three years ago. I had my art business reach the level where my income that I was making from art on the side was matching the income I got at the college. And when it matched the income I got at the college, not for one month, for several months, I stashed that all away so that I had some, a cushion, and then I quit. I walked away so that I could have my own business and become a working artist full time. And it's possible for you to do the same thing. Now I have the freedom to live where I want, work when I want, and on what I want. And I wanna share that freedom with others as well. So like I said, I'm on a mission to kill that myth of the starving artist, to move you from being a starving artist to a thriving artist. So I wanna help you rewrite your story because when you rewrite your story, when you change the things that you're telling yourself are possible, when you stop telling yourself, I can't, and you switch to, I can, You'll change not just yourself, but the rest of the world. I want to go back to that idea of impact because impact is way more than money. Money is fabulous and we all need to eat and we all want to have sustainable careers. But impact is important as well. Impact is the change you can make by sharing your work with the world. Whatever you decide is the work that you're going to do. Who are you to hide your impact from the world? The world needs your paintings. The world needs your teaching. The world needs you. So even if you don't join my course that's opening for enrollment right now, The Painter's Path, I want you to figure out how you're going to define your success path and how you're going to have an impact on the world. I want you to realize that your paintings can change the world one person at a time. Don't lock your paintings away. Realize that they can make an impact. So if you're interested in joining the painter's path and taking your paintings to the next level, if you're interested in making 2019 your most successful year ever, then I'd love to invite you to join the Painter's Path. Enrollment will be open through Friday, this Friday at midnight. What you get when you join the program are eight modules that will take you through literally the path, success path that I have created um, within the course for students to move from not quite knowing what it is they want to do to feeling full of confidence about how they define their success and the steps that they need to take to get there. So we start with looking at your belief systems and reframing those so that you begin to embody the thriving artist mindset rather than the starving artist mindset. Then we look at the processes that you need to put in place that are going to 
create that success path. So we work through the artwork living framework to create the awesome art, the processes and strategies that will help you identify those income streams and put together the plan that's gonna get you there and how you're gonna feed your creativity in order to feed your art and feed your work. Those eight modules run over 12 weeks so that you have plenty of time to implement those. Each week, we hop on a call all together, face to face. Thank you. That's another benefit of the internet. The internet lets us connect face to face so that we can talk about what those challenges are from the week and what successes that people have had. Because the truth is, you can do it all on your own. But when you're part of a community that is all moving towards the same goal of becoming a thriving artist, everything you do becomes amplified. Community is an, a really crucial part of developing any new habit. Remember we talked about that as we talked about developing the habit loop. That when you have accountability, it dramatically increases the potential that you have to succeed at whatever that new opportunity is. So we'll focus on scary, big, hairy goals and how you're going to get there. And it's my job to move you along that path. Now, I know that we've talked about a lot this week and I've given you enough here. You actually could go do a lot of this yourself. But if you're ready to get started and you'd like some help along the way, I would be honored to be part of that process. You can check out The Painter's Path at marygilkerson.com forward slash painter's path, all one word. We'll be typing that link into the caption up above and into the comments in just a second. So painter's path forwards, uh, marygilkerson.com forward slash painter's path is where you go to find out more information about the program. And I'll be around as will my team to answer any and all questions you have um, this afternoon and through the end of the week. So let me dive in here and see what questions people have about the whole process that we've been going through. Uh, Laura says pricing, she says, says pricing is hard. It is, but you know, one of the reasons that pricing is hard is that we tend to not value our own work. We tend to put a lot of value on what other people do, but it is really hard for us to value our own work. So I use a formula that we go over in the course that is based on the amount of time that you've spent in creating the average piece, as well as the cost of materials that are involved in creating. And then you also wanna place it or position it within the marketplace. So while it feels awkward, when you take away the, how we feel about our work, and you put it into a formula, it becomes a whole lot easier. Because when you put it into a formula, it takes away that embarrassment that we have about asking for what our work is worth. And especially when you have a chance to look at the market that surrounds your work and to evaluate what other people are getting. So it's super important to value what you do because that value becomes part of the transaction, not just the money, but the valuation. People value artwork based on how you make them feel. And making people feel better about the world around them, bringing them joy, that's priceless. So don't feel bad about asking for money for your work. That goes back to part of that starving artist mindset where we've been told that making money from our art means that we're selling out. That is baloney and hooey. Anybody ever been told that? Um, I heard that at times in school. 
uh, that if we were trying to sell our paintings, if we were trying to market our art, and the, the people out there who were successful who had marketed it, their work, they'd sold out. They'd gone, gone down their, the river and cheapened their artwork. That is a voice of jealousy talking. It's not an empowered, thriving artist talking. It's somebody who's stuck in the starving artist mindset. So if you've ever been told that, tell yourself a new story. This is what I'm talking about, rewriting your story. Because your work has value. And you have something to say. You have an impact to make on the world. And you owe it to the world to make that impact. So get out of your own way. We all need to get out of our own way and ask for what it's worth. Donna says, oops, these are coming fast and furious. Donna says that in my area, at least, if somebody wants art, they just go to the local Walmart or bargain bin shop to buy their art. And that won't stop me from painting as this is something I love. But I wish they knew the value of something real and worthy. Again, I want to go back there, Donna, and you've heard me preach this to you before. Donna's one of my students um, in the Composition, Color, and Light course. Um, when you look at your artwork and you look at the surrounding local market, you're limiting yourself terribly. Go back to what I said earlier about the gatekeepers being gone. All of us, every last one of us, whether we are in Cross South Carolina, Savannah, Georgia, Denver, Colorado, or small town USA, Eastern Europe, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, an island in Canada. We all have access to the global art market. Remember what I said? It's $63 billion annually. So the local scene is not your only market. You have to think about your market in a totally different way. Thinking that the local market was the only avenue that we have is old school thinking. It's not true anymore. We have a huge, huge global marketplace. I ship my paintings all over the world. There are not that many barriers to doing that. It is not that expensive to ship small paintings or even larger paintings when you're talking about the overall cost of the painting overseas. There are ways to do that. So don't think about your market being limited to just the local market. Get the website up and going and then use social media to share your work with your, the world and move your audience from social media to your website to make sales. But get past that local market idea. The local market is only one part of your market. It is this big in comparison to everything else. You have to reach out beyond your local market. If I depended on just my local market in South Carolina or here in Georgia, I'd starve to death. I would not make enough money to live and I make enough money to live. It is possible because I know I've done it to have a multi six figure income from your art business, but you're not going to necessarily be able to do that relying just on your local market. You've got to go more global. So that's the answer. Yes, Cindy, good enough is another big takeaway that I want you to hear because your work, and I know your work in particular, is more than good enough. The biggest issue that most of us face is not producing the work, it's getting it out there and believing that there's a market for it, that there's a market beyond our own local scene, and realizing that it doesn't have to take 40 hours a week in order to do that. It doesn't have to be painful to do that. It doesn't mean that you have to have fancy sales pages and produce highly produced videos in order to do that. Remember that cell phone you have, it's good enough. And good enough is where you need to start. So let me back up to the beginning here because I know I've missed some questions at, right at the beginning. 
Yes, Donna, you do need a website and I'm going to give you a hard time if you don't get one started. So there are easy ways to do that and you need to just get started on it. And that's the way you're going to get beyond that local one. And I know you sell on Facebook and social media right now. So just think what you'd be doing if you had a website in addition to it. So excellent. Yeah. Diane says, I remember that selling out crap from art school too. I never understood it either. No, me either. And it is total crap. I love that you said that because I call BS on the selling out part too. Um, there were all sorts of stories that we were told as students. Um, one that you had, uh, this is one that I totally bought into that you have to live in New York in order to make a living as an artist to make it and to be able to sell your work. So I packed all my stuff into my car with my two cats and I moved to New York and promptly starved because I, along with every fourth person walking down Fifth Avenue was carrying a portfolio. You don't have to live in New York. With the advent of the online art market, you can live anywhere. You don't have to be in New York to be successful. And New York doesn't have a stranglehold on the art market anymore. That's gone away. Because of the global economy, there are art markets, not just one single one. There are art markets around locations. There are art markets around mediums. There are art markets around styles. There are so many art markets that you'll be able to find the one that's right for your work. It's not a matter of finding the one single art market to make it. So another story um, that I heard was that if you didn't make it when you were young, you wouldn't make it at all. So if you didn't get into a big gallery by the time you were 30, you were just over the hill. And I hear that concern a lot of times from students now. Again, I call BS on that. One of my friends who passed away this past year uh, had an extraordinarily successful art career and she wasn't able to start it full time until she was 65. So for 30 years, she had the most extraordinary successful career of anyone I know personally and had a fantastic, wonderful, creative life. So she worked in her studio, notice she showed up every day, from around 8.30 in the morning until about 3.30 or 4.30 for decades, and was still working in the week before she passed away. So she made more money after she retired than she ever made before she retired. She was the top selling artist, I think she still is, in the gallery, that main gallery that I show in. So age is not a limitation. What is the biggest limitation is our belief system and the stories we tell ourselves. So you absolutely can do it if you, no matter what age you are. Think about Grandma Moses, for example. Another one that I hear, another story that we got told was that you have to have a degree that if you don't have a BFA or an MFA, you'll never get into a gallery. Now I've had that conversation with students as well who think that they need to get an MFA in order to get into a gallery or in order to sell their work. Newsflash, they don't care. There are a handful of galleries in New York that stop the MFA graduate students, but really that is not a thing. Galleries care about the work that you make. They wanna know that you're gonna create a sustainable, consistent body of work so that they can spend, know that it's worth it to spend the time building an audience along with you, that you're going to be able to make the work to provide to the collectors. They do not particularly care about the degree that you have. Now that degree becomes part of your resume and part of your story, but that's all it is. It's not the thing. It's not your golden ticket. In fact, I have some real strong feelings about MFA programs and about how much they cost and the stories that they tell their students that they're an extraordinarily expensive way 
to get a piece of paper that is not going to get you necessarily down along the success path that you want. So be careful of MFA programs. There are easier ways to learn what you need to learn. And college art programs tend to not teach their students how to develop an audience, how to get into galleries. They're better about it than they used to be. I taught a course like that at Columbia College when I was still there for about, I think it was eight years. But it was the first one like that that we had. And it was part of an uh, intentional effort that we made around the state to begin to educate our students on how to make a living. Because I think knowing how to make a living as an artist is important. We shouldn't be creating more of the starving artist mentality. So rewrite those stories and think about the potential and the way that you can. Yeah, I'm kicking your butt, Donna Spears Lawson. I am kicking your butt really hard. I want you to get out there and do that. Exactly. Um, Janice asks, do you discount for family and friends? Um, actually, no, I don't. Or very rarely, I will. Because the problem is, once you start discounting your work, then you create a, a never-ending cycle of discounts. So I just don't discount unless somebody's buying more than one piece at a time. So if somebody is buying two pieces at the same time or three pieces at the same time, then I'll give a discount, but it's small. It's not huge. I want you to be really, really careful on discounting your work. It is not a good practice. It goes back into that belief system that my work is not worth enough. And it trains and teaches your collectors that your work is not good enough. So there's a store that I know of in Columbia that started doing a 20% off day. And at first, it was kind of a random thing. And you had to be on their email list to know about it. Then it became a regular thing. And it would be, when it became a regular thing, guess what happened? People stopped shopping during the regular days and they only shopped on the discount days. They trained their customers to wait for the discount. And I don't think that's sustainable. Don't do that. Definitely don't do that. Debbie says, I feel bad selling my paintings. In what way, Debbie? Um, think of it as an exchange. I think one of the most impactful times I've ever had talking to somebody who was buying one of my paintings was listening to him talk about how it made him feel. So his whole face lit up and he was talking about how the paintings I'd made of a certain landscape could have been the landscape of his childhood and that it reminded him of being 13, 14, and roaming the woods and the freedom that he and his friends had, the sunlight falling on the trees and the fields. The look on his face made me feel as joyful as he felt. That felt good. And knowing that when he bought that painting and hung it on his wall, every time he looked at it, he was going to have those memories triggered, made me feel good. So. Think a bit, look at hard at what it is about selling your paintings that makes you feel bad. Is it that you don't feel like your paintings are good enough? Is it that you've been told that story that if you sell, you're selling out? Or is it that you want to hold on to them? They're your babies still. We, a lot of us feel that way at one time or another. But the truth is you can't keep all of your paintings if you're painting on a regular basis. They need to go out into the world. You might not be interested at all or need to make money from your paintings and that's fine but you can still have an impact i'm thinking of one of my students who has a great love of the national parks and the impact she wants to have is to bring awareness of the national parks to her audience so that they go out and experience them themselves and support the national parks so her impact is not just selling paintings it is raising awareness around a cause that's very, very dear to her heart. So think about the impact you could have. And that's one of the things that'll make it easier to sell. 
Nancy says, do you frame all your paintings for sale and how long do you haul them to dry before mailing? Um, the answer to that is it depends. I frame things that are going into the gallery if they're not gallery wrapped canvases. On my website, I don't frame them in order to sell. And how long they have to dry depends on the humidity and the climate where you live. So you need to make sure they're thoroughly dry before you pack them up or you can have a hot, nasty, sticky mess, especially in the summer heat. So I would pay attention to how long your, it takes your painting to dry completely so that when you touch it, it's not tacky. And a general rule of thumb is about two weeks. It may take a little bit more depending, depending on where you are. So that's a depends question. Yeah, um, exactly, Lori Lamb. People value the artwork based on how we make them feel, how the painting makes them feel. People buy based on emotion. They tell themselves a story intellectually that justifies it, but they buy based on emotion. So you need to appeal to that emotion. Debbie says, I don't know how to price my paintings. Will you teach that? Absolutely, I definitely teach that. So like I said, there's a formula for that that we go through. And I absolutely will walk through students through exactly how to price their work and how to research the niche that they're in and make sure they're not charging too little or too much. Um, Judy says, thank you so much for the challenge. I'm so glad it's been a valuable journey there, Judy. Excellent. Let us know what you was the biggest aha from the challenge there. Yay, Lori is um, one of my students in the current cohort of the Painter's Path. I'm so glad that you recommend it, Lori. Lori has been creating wonderful paintings that she's getting out there into the world. Let's see, definitely Donna says the world needs more beauty. I agree. I think the world needs more paintings. There is, a market for every type of art that's out there. You don't have to have a particular kind of style in order to sell your work or to find an audience that needs to see your work. I think that when I look at the students that I've taught over the last 25, 30 years, there's no single style that those students have that have been successful. I have students that are working in pure abstraction, in um, a form of abstraction, but you can still recognize the, the subject matter to hyper realism. Your style is yours and it'll happen all on its own when you paint consistently and when you show up. Now, one of the things that's in the painter's path to help people make sure they're beginning to create their own style is the composition color and light course. That course addresses, that's a bonus in the course, and that course addresses how to make awesome paintings so that they leap off the wall and grab the audience's attention so that they're strong compositionally. They're using value patterns that attract the viewer. They're using colors that are harmonious and attract the viewer, and they're filled with light. So the tools are in there whether you need to work more on your paintings or you need to work more on the business side. I've got you covered on both. So the course includes those eight modules, but it also has two bonuses. It has the composition color and light course, and it has the painter's business course, which gets into the nitty gritty of how you create those business strategies that are gonna make you successful. Whether it's building a website, building an email list, or creating a promotion around your work. So a bunch of my students in the painters, current painters, current students in the painter's path are launching paintings around Mother's Day right now. And at least one that I know of has already sold paintings out of that body of work, just using the strategies that we cover around social media. So it works. So let me know if you have, oops, I see more comments down here that I have not gotten. Yeah, Donna, you can live in the remote area of Northern Canada and sell art. I'm telling you, you can, because I live in the remote Southeast. Columbia, South Carolina is not the art capital of the South. 
and I make a living selling art to the point that now I can spend time on the coast. I'm splitting my time between Savannah, Georgia on the coast and Columbia. So you don't have to be in a major art center. You can be in Northern Ontario. You can make a living. You can be anywhere as long as you have an internet connection and make a living as an artist. Yes, and as Lori Lamb says, FASO is a great solution for websites. I'm a big fan of FASO. Exactly. Um, Casey says, how about you have to have a BFA? Bingo. Yeah, I've heard that one. I don't know how many times. And you don't. You can create your own artistic education. What I suggested for one of my students who was talking about getting an MFA, and I'm not talking about my college students, I'm talking about my online students. So she was considering going back and getting an MFA. Well, the average MFA costs about $100,000. That's not a real good solution. And my suggestion for her was that she study with two or three artists online even if there were premium courses and that she would get the same education that she would get if she went to an MFA, get an MFA at a fraction of the cost. That's what she did. And she is now in, I think the last time I counted three commercial galleries and has had, has her first solo show at a museum scheduled. So you don't have to have the BFA or the MFA in order to do it. You definitely do not have to have that degree. Let's see. Inex says, I would love to know more about the online art marketing. I am limited to my local market and have a room full of ready framed paintings. Yeah, the online marketing is a lot of fun, actually. And you're having a building relationships with people. So you get to know your clients and customers and you have conversations with them. So when you have a conversation and you build a relationship and then you let people know that you have work available, it doesn't feel sleazy and slimy because you've been building that relationship all along. So they're moving from being a, what we call a cold audience to being a warm audience, to being a hot audience. And it happens very naturally. It's a progression that follows a certain sequence so that it it's becomes a whole lot more predictable. So yes, it definitely works. So I if you want to learn more, just go to Mary Gilkerson.com forward slash painters path and you can check out the course. Cindy says I've had responses to my work that echoes being told this is perfect. Leave it. Don't touch it. Absolutely. I think I've been one of those people who's told you that too. Um, I know the faults too tight color shadows, not right. This discussion has been invaluable to me where I am mentally, which is depressed that I work so hard and it's not good enough. Oh, Cindy, your work, which I do know well is more than good enough. And I want you to get out of your own way and share it with the world a whole lot more than you've been doing. So she says, I've also heard other artists say, you haven't seen the umpteen failures to get the good one. This is so true. Um, when we are posting online, we tend not to share the ones that don't work. And when I did my first daily painting project, I committed to showing the ones that didn't work as well, but I don't do that anymore. Um, I showed the, what I call the gloopy paintings. I showed the messy middle because that was part of my project. But you don't get to see the messy middle inside of somebody's studio very often. And so you don't know what fell flat on its face. And you get this idea of perfection so that people think that every painting that comes out of the studios of the painters they admire is a home run. Truth is, it's not. One of my main mentors in graduate school um, told us something that has stuck with me ever since. He told us that if we wanted to make successful paintings, if we wanted to have 50 successful paintings, that we needed to make 100 paintings. And that by doing that, it would do two things. First, it would make the paintings less precious. And that we made, when we made them less precious, 
we were more likely to make good paintings. So it made us freer to paint and we actually made better paintings. And I watched him destroy a whole body of work that he didn't think was up to the standard that he wanted to send to his gallery. Now he's quite a successful artist and has had galleries in all the major art centers in the US and had many, many multiple solo shows in all of those areas, work in major museums and galleries. And when I watched him destroy the work that was supposed to be going for a solo show, which, and he left himself with a very short time frame in order to make better paintings, but he decided they weren't up to his standards. And I watched him make more than 100 paintings in order to get the 50 really good ones. That stuck because he was successful. So I had this role model in front of me that showed me how to do that part. So make more pieces and allow the bad ones to happen and put them away. I have a rework bin. You can't see it because that corner is not showing in the studio right now. But even here in Savannah, I have a rework bin. That box holds the paintings that are just not working. They were failures. And I'm either going to sand them down outside with a dust mask and paint on top of them, or I'm going to destroy them. And I do destroy paintings that don't work, but I don't show them necessarily. So you're absolutely right. You just don't see the ones that were rejected. Donna says, I found through the years that perfect is overrated and that sometimes a half finished painting is perfect only because of its imperfection. Yeah, I actually think the imperfections are what really attract people to successful paintings. So one of the things I advocate is stop again, stopping before you think you're finished on a painting that when you paint confidently, when you paint freely and you paint without the um, over nagging voice of the perfectionist that you make better work. Marianne says I followed, but never posted because I wasn't painting. This experience has been wonderful, ready to keep moving forward. Excellent. So share with us, Miriam, some of the things that you're going to do to keep yourself moving forward. What worked for you about the challenge and what are you going to make adjustments to? How are you going to apply what we've talked about to the habit of your work of making an impact? Cindy says, I won an award for a painting that I didn't consider finished. I'm not surprised. A lot of times when we don't overwork, the paintings, they're really a whole lot better. Teresa says, that's amazing. I had the myth in my head that you needed a degree to show in a gallery. From actual gallery owners, when I first began showing 20 years ago, and it's stuck in my head ever since. I think there was probably more of an emphasis on that 20 years ago, Teresa, and a lot of those galleries that had that stuck in their, their belief system are no longer with us because the galleries that made it through the Great Recession were the ones that were really concerned about really good art and not necessarily about some sort of fake bio or some sort of glitzed up bio about the artist. They're really selling the work, not just the artist. It's the full story. So yeah, you do not have to have the, the fancy degree in order to be successful. Far from it. It's just, I think the degree gives people at times a sense of, of um, a sense that, that they have the potential and the opportunity, they have confidence. So degree can give you confidence, but you don't have to find your confidence just from a degree, far from it. There are all kinds of other things that are equally important. I've watched a friend who does not have an MFA. Um, feel the lack of that MFA to the point it's held her back at times. So don't let a degree or a lack of degree get in your way at all, for sure. And I think looking at a gallery as one leg of your three-legged income streams is a really good option. The right gallery is a fantastic partner. 
It just should not be your only partner, not ever. I lived through that, and that's not a comfortable place to be. When your sales start to dry up, it can be alarming when you've counted on that income, when you've had it coming in regularly for X number of years, and then it's not there. So it is a whole lot more comfortable to be in control of your own income streams. Yes, Casey says, I discount rarely, but it's hard to draw that line. The only time I offer discounts is when people buy multiple pieces at the same time. That's it. And one of the things that I do, um, and I've done this for a long time, even before I had any employees, is I say my business manager won't let me do it. They don't have to know that I'm my business manager. But I just say my business manager just doesn't allow that. So that's my answer to a lot of the things that are hard to say no to. My business manager just doesn't allow it. Andrea says, my PhD, not in art, stands for piled higher and deeper. <laughs> it's about doing the work. Absolutely. She says, I stay home and care for kids and parents. My education is for me. I don't need the label. Absolutely. Um, I think the idea that we've gotten in the last 20 years or so that degrees are for job tickets is a real scary one because that's not what college degrees are for. Um, not at all. So totally agree with you there. Um, and it is still possible to have an art career, whether you're staying at home and taking care of kids and parents or not. So it's actually one of those things that's easier to do from home than a lot of other things. And at FASO is a fine art studio online. It's a company that produces websites just for artists. So a lot of people in the painter's path use them. Michelle says, I'm so inspired. I am so glad. Excellent. Casey says, great website with plug and play formats. She's talking about FASO. I totally agree. Love FASO. Patty says, the challenge has been terrific for her, assisting her in creating a daily routine and helping her focus. I am so glad. Absolutely. Sigrid says, will the painter's path be as useful in Denmark as in the USA, or is there too much difference in how the art world works around the world? Uh, Sigrid, I have students who are in the UK, in Canada. I have students who in, are in Australia, as well as students in the US. The art market is a global one. So you can sell just in Denmark if you want to, but you can also sell around the world. So you don't need to be limited to your own locale. There are some differences, I think, in the kind of language you use or should use in marketing to different countries. I think only in the sense that um, Certain types of more pushy marketing does not work outside the US, but that's not what I'm teaching students to do. Uh, I'm a big believer in a more soft touch in trying to make sales. So that works wherever you are. So, yes, it works outside of the US, it's not country specific. And I want all of my students to realize that they don't need to rely on sales just in one country. So you can sell outside of your home country. Yeah, and that says neither is Guadalajara, Mexico. Yeah, we don't think of that necessarily as being an art center any more than Columbia, South Carolina, but you can sell from anywhere. It doesn't have to be in one particular place. Yes, I totally agree, Casey. There's something to be said for being a lifelong learner. In fact, I think there is so much to be said for being a lifelong learner. And almost everything is available online right now. And that can be a little bit overwhelming. It can actually stop people cold in their tracks because they're just not sure which way to go. So pick a mentor that you trust, that you relate to, who has gone down the path that you want to go down. And then walk behind following the same trail that they have blazed already. 
and you'll get there faster than they did because they have figured those things out. Janice says, I have a website. I don't use it. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. I don't use them for promoting my art. I have a studio with a guest book and I'm not using email to keep in touch. Still working on producing sellable work. So much to learn. If you're working on producing sellable work, my guess is your work is already sellable and you've got all the tools already. You just need the strategies that you can put into place to make those things work. So think about using strategies that can put those things to work for you instead of just waiting around for people to show up. So if you've got a website and if you've got social media channels already, like a Facebook page and an Instagram profile, you're ready to go and it doesn't have to be a barrier. Email, when you're selling, sending out emails to an audience, there are laws around how you do that. You can't just use Gmail and then send out a blast. So you need to have an email service provider. And one of the easiest to get started with is MailChimp. It's free for the first 2,000 subscribers that you get. So it doesn't have to cost a whole lot to get started. But the time to build an email list is now. The best time to build it was five years ago, but second best is right now. So get that email list started before you're ready to sell the work so that when you're ready to sell the work, your audience is there waiting. And I'm guessing the work is actually a whole lot closer to being ready than you think it is. Probably way closer to being ready than you think it is. So I'm just typing the web address in there of the course so that you can go to it to get more information if you want to. So let me scroll back up here through the, whoops. There we go. Uh, lost the question for just a second. Casey says, how important is having a blog or a vlog? I think it's really important. And it doesn't have to be a roadblock. And it can be something you slowly develop. You can start with just social media. But having a blog and making regular updates to your website um, brings you higher recognition on the search platforms, on the search engines like uh, Google or Bing. And that means that when people type in things that are related to your work, they're more likely to find you. So having a regularly updated website, whether you're posting on pages or you're posting on blog posts, really doesn't matter. You need to be posting and updating regularly. So I think it's really important. Those things don't have to be super different from what you send out in your email, but you need to do it. And you need to post regularly on social media. Just like with painting, you need to take those steps on a regular basis so it becomes a habit so that you show up and do the work. And when you do that, magical things happen. Every time we do the five-day challenge, and I mean every single time that we've done the five-day challenge, because people show up on a regular basis and post their work regularly on their social media channels, People sell those paintings and it's not some secret magic formula there. It's because they show up and do that work. They've made the paintings. They've made the awesome paintings they love. They're sharing them on a regular basis. And because you're doing it regularly, the algorithm on Facebook and Instagram loves that and they show your stuff to more people. So when you take that simple strategy and then you add some additional strategies to it that broaden and amplify your audience, then you can go gangbusters. But the, the fundamental part of the artwork living system is right there in the challenge that we just completed. So yes, it's important to post really, really important to post. Christine says, why would selling a painting feel sleazy or slimy? It does to some people because they have that belief, that false belief, that selling your art is selling out and that can feel bad. And people then feel bad asking for money for their paintings. I don't feel sleazy or slimy selling paintings and I don't want my students to ever feel that way. But when you um, have that natural progression 
that develops in the conversations and the relationships you build with your audience, then presenting and offering your work for sale becomes a natural thing rather than feeling awkward. And awkward can feel sleazy. Yeah, I agree. It just means they like your painting. They feel moved by your painting in some way. Yeah, Casey, I love that. I've, I've been told that story too, that in Japan, if you want to become a potter, you spend a year cleaning the studio, then you spend time wedging the clay, then stoking the kiln, and then you begin to make tea bowls, and after a thousand, they call you a junior potter. So there is the story, there is the theory that you need to spend 10,000 hours to become an expert in anything. To a degree, I think that's true, but I think it's less about the number of hours and it's more about the consistency of doing the work. It doesn't happen by thinking about it. It doesn't happen about dreaming about it. It comes from showing up and doing small steps on a regular basis in a habitual way. It comes from building routines that work. The routines are based on strategies that are proven that we know works because when you do X, Y, Z, then A happens. So that's what I mean by routines and strategies. Tori says, we're the only ones who decide who gets to say we are or what we produce is good enough. Totally agree. And you don't want to listen to every opinion or critique. Critiques can be fantastic, but they're not always, as Tori says, given with good intentions. So I have real strong feelings about critiques because I've seen students torn apart by critiques. And it's one of the reasons that I teach the critique sandwich because that's productive criticism. That's showing people how to take the next step forward. It's not about trying to make yourself feel bigger than the person that you're tearing down. And that tearing people down and critique is not helpful at all. We've booted people from the free Facebook group for doing things like that. And I will continue to boot people for doing things like that. Tori says, is there a general percentage of income from one's art that you put back into supplies for the next projects? Um, I think that depends on the cost of the materials that you use. So you want to, I would say probably 10% at least is going to go back into the cost of materials. I think you have to reinvest in the business, no matter what the business is, whether you're selling paintings or you're selling widgets, you need to reinvest in the business. And that comes in the form of buying the materials and tools you need and upgrading the materials and tools that you need. But it also comes in professional development that never stops. It goes back to what Casey was talking about with the, lifelong learner idea that you need to give yourself the tools that you need and upgrade them mentally periodically. I still take online courses, not in painting, but in other areas. So you need to continuously keep learning and learn those new skills. Marianne says, I'm going to show up, be happy with the successes and accepting of the unsuccessful pieces and try to keep on learning. Good, excellent, I am glad to hear that. Denise says, the challenges always, always jumpstart my creativity, even though um, I art in some way every day. I am so glad that you feel that way, Denise. That is excellent. And yeah, it is important, I think, for us to support each other's paths, because we all move forward further when we're moving together. And that's important whether people are in the free Facebook group or in the paid courses or in the member paid membership. We move further when we move together. Don't jealously guard all your stuff. That's a lack mentality. And when you function from a lack mentality, if you try to hoard all your stuff, whether it's your paintings or your tools or your ideas, you won't get a whole lot back. So one of the truths of the universe is you get back what you put out. So share freely and share often, and you'll get an amazing amount in return. So we move forward together. 
Yes. Um, Casey says if Moo, anybody needs a business card, Moo's having a sale. Yeah. Moo has great business cards. I, I use them for postcards and business cards, but I don't really use postcards very much. So postcard, I mean, business cards very much. Postcards I use more often. Um, can we pick you? Yes, Ann Davis, you absolutely can pick me as a mentor. And it has been my pleasure to be your mentor. Ann is one of my students in the Painter's Path and has been doing fantastic things in the past year. One of the things that Ann did even before she joined the Painter's Path was to promote her paintings this past Christmas during the holiday season, during a challenge that we had. And I was so proud of what you did, Ann, there, because she grew her email list through the way that she promoted her holiday open studio. So, yeah, it is so much fun to watch y'all take off and grow your business and to market and sell your paintings confidently as well as make your paintings confidently. I like seeing the whole artist being developed. Yeah. Christine says it's easier to charge for a painting from someone she doesn't know and harder when she knows them. I think that's true a lot of times for a lot of people. Yeah, um, there are definitely laws around email. That's one of the things we cover in the course. So make sure as you're collecting email addresses that you are complying with the law and you have to comply with the law of the places where people live, whether they're in Canada or the EU or the UK or the US. So it's just good business practices and it actually makes for a better customer experience. So it's really, really important. Um, Dara, the steps to starting a blog, the steps, we go over that a lot in the course, but basically you're developing content that tells your story as an artist and the story of your paintings. So the steps to starting a blog, first of all, you got to make the paintings, then you need to sit down and write those paintings story and then post them on your website. Yay, Leslie, I'm glad that you've enjoyed it. Yes, Denise says she sold a painting from the one of the 20 minute challenges. Excellent. I'm glad you love selling your paintings, Bonnie. I think it's important. Yeah, I have, yes. I have seen um, people escalate really fast by working hard and by following through. I agree, Casey. Yes. I, that may become a, a program title, Ginger. She's talking about X, Y, Z equals A. That could be a good program title. Um, Andrea says, screen time stresses me out. How much time is needed online for all of this? Tech stuff takes me forever, and I've been avoiding it. So the course has probably about an hour's worth of videos each week. And then we have a live Q&A coaching session each week where we can see each other through Zoom. And that doesn't have, you don't have to do that all online. You can watch, download those videos and watch them on your TV set if that feels more comfortable. It is not all live. The only live part of it is the coaching call that we have during each week of the 12-week sessions. At the end of those 12 weeks, we move to a monthly call. So you have support for that full year. So um, Bonnie says, do you ever pop over to our Facebook page and art pages to see our art? I do. I love to do what my daughter calls snoop a lot. I love to look. It is fun. So, and I'm glad you love what you're doing. It, it, it shows. And I think that's one reason that you've been selling so much is that you love what you're doing. And when you talk about it, that comes through. And people, again, connect on that emotional level. And so they know you love it. And then they love, fall in love with the work because they've already fallen in love with you as the artist. Yes, I agree, Casey. MailChimp is one of the things I programs I were, uh, recommend because it's free and it helps with that compliance level. Janice says, some people say not to put out work 
any work but your best. And that concept stops me a lot. I'm not confident of critiquing my own artwork. That's my problem with that whole idea, Janice, is that a lot of us are perfectionists. And raise your hand if you're a recovering perfectionist. I'm not sure sometimes that I've fully recovered from that. But yeah, I can be a perfectionist as well. And one of the things that you have to really take in is that done is better than perfect. You will never be perfect. Your paintings will never be perfect. You need to get started and get started now. So don't wait for your paintings to be perfect. They just need to be. There's already an audience out there waiting for them. So you need to share them. You owe it to the world to share them so that you can make a difference in the lives of the people who are looking at them. So absolutely. Um, Andrea says, how much do you spend online? Oh, for the art business. I gotcha. Um, it could be as little as, you don't have to spend anything for PayPal other than the, the percentage that they take for processing credit cards. Um, you can get more fancy shopping carts than that, but you can start with the free version of PayPal business. You can start with a website from FASO, for example, which is really easy and low tech. You can start with FASO for their premium program for under $30 a month. So it doesn't have to cost more than that. It can be $30 a month and you can get going. That is, I think probably, that's the bare minimum because MailChimp, like I said, is free. Um, but FASO also includes an email system as well. I just think MailChimp is more effective. It doesn't have to cost the earth. You could actually get started just with your cell phone and your social media accounts, make enough money then to pay for the FASO website. So you could start with zero. Now I spend more because I do a whole lot more marketing and I run Facebook ads and I advertise in print media and I have multiple websites that I host on different sites and I pay more for hosting. So it's a whole range, but you can start for very, very, very little. How much time do I spend online? Um, probably about, it depends on whether I'm in the midst of a, the big course or not, but I can get by with spending just about an, 30 minutes to an hour online a day. So it doesn't have to take all your day. Um, you can batch it and do it on say, you can do all of it in a morning and then have it scheduled to go out through the rest of the week. So you can pretty much figure out your schedule. The way my day look, my week looks right now is that I schedule call coaching calls with students and work with clients on Mondays and Tuesdays and partially on Wednesdays. But pretty much my on, the online part of my business takes two days out of the week. The rest of the week is painting. So it depends on what you want your ideal week to look like. You could schedule it so it's part of every day or you can schedule so it's part of two days. And it's not all day on those two days. It's just part of the day. So that's what it looks like for me. Then I go paint where I want to go paint and my office is outdoors. And now since I've been able to move back to the coast, it's outdoors on the marshes, on the beach, where my heart place is. So Diane says the idea of posting the challenge paintings out there has been difficult. Yeah, because you're vulnerable when you put your stuff out there, but it gets easier every time you do it. It definitely gets easier. Yeah. Um, I don't think that the studies that you've done, Diane, are awful. I've looked at a couple of yours. They're fine. You are underestimating them. And Bonnie, the way to get organized is to have a process. And that's one of the, the in fact, that is one whole module in the course is about creating the processes that are going to work for you. 
So the processes are the routines that become habits. And you create the process around the kind of life that you want to live and where you are right now and the success path that you want to create. So absolutely. Definitely we can help with that. Jill says, still have not started the challenge. You can start later. And I am so glad that it has gotten you started thinking about unblocking yourself. Excellent. So great questions, everybody. So I just want to recap what we've talked about over the course of the week. We've talked about how you can create a successful, thriving painting practice. And that the place that you start doing that is by having that consistent, confident painting, solid studio practice where you show up on a regular basis and create awesome work that you love. And that then to be a thriving artist, you identify the success path that you want to go down. What's your there that you want to get to? It might be different from mine. Is it money? Is it recognition? Is it a cause that you love? What is it that you really want? Identify that as the success path. Then find the business strategies that are going to help you get there. How are you going to create a life that feeds those other two things? So we've talked about that three-legged stool that revolves around art, work and living the painter's path framework that is at the core of what we've been discussing and i'm going to be posting a link and sharing that or i'm just going to share it directly i have a cersei for everybody who came today and i'm going to be posting the link to that in the caption once we hop off but it's the painter's path roadmap it is the outline of the path you need to take to create that sustainable painting practice. So I invite you to download that and to check out the course for more information about how I can help you be your mentor and guide on creating your own success path towards creating your own thriving, successful art practice. Thank you all for joining me during the challenge. I'll be back later this week with some more ideas for you to think about in creating that thriving, successful painting practice. Happy painting, everybody. Bye-bye for now.